Hey, deserving listeners. Recently, I did an interview on another podcast called Growth Island with Mads Fries. The podcast is called Growth Island, and the fella who was interviewing me, his name was Mads Fries. And so I thought I would just play that interview for you here. We talk a lot about attachment. Let's get to it. Thank you for tuning in today. So today, we're going to talk about one of the most important areas in our life, relationships. So I'm not sure about you, but that's definitely something that I would love to learn more about and not the area that I'm the biggest expert. So with me today, I got Kurt Honda. Kirk, thank you so much for spending the time with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Kirk, tell me a little bit about yourself and this podcast you're running. Yeah, we've been doing it for 12 years and I'm a licensed therapist and a professor that I've been for over 20 years and it's been fun. Uh, we've recently started doing reaction videos on YouTube that people like. I've been watching reality TV shows. I've never watched reality TV, but <laughs> some people asked me to watch it. And so I started watching it and reacting to it. And people are responding because I'm not bashing on the people. I'm actually trying to be respectful and analyze their relationships. And some people are saying that it's helping them to get along better, to reduce conflict in their marriages and to increase their intimacy. But I'm sure there's plenty of people who don't benefit from it at all and hate everything I'm doing. But but the few people who respond seem to like it. That sounds nice and super interesting. Actually, I'll have to listen to more of that. I don't see that much reality myself, but uh, I think it's interesting to get the kind of psychologist perspective on what we can learn. Yeah. So looking into an area that you are big on and very interested on is relationships and attachment styles. And yeah. it's something that I would definitely love to learn some more about because I know I am not perfect at all in that regard. Like what, what can we learn about that? Well, the very simple thing that I could say is that we evolved as humans, similar to other primates, as very social creatures in that in the same way we need food and water and shelter, we need other humans to thrive. It's a evolved need that we have in the same way that when you're thirsty, a certain mechanism kicks into your body that compels you to search for and to want water in the same way that when you're hungry, your body gives you all these, you know, cues of that you need food and fuel. And when we're alone and feel isolated and not physically touched or emotionally loved enough, then our body has a physical reaction to that. Uh, usually it's in the form of emotions or, you know, longing or heartache, these kinds of things that people will describe. And it can happen on, on a minute by minute basis. You could just be sitting on with your spouse watching TV and, this, and you just kind of feel distant. You feel a little alone. You feel maybe hurt, something they said something they did. And it's an emotion. It's the same need that we have for food and water, like I said. And so paying attention to that and then being able to bid for a security with your spouse is, is the key. You, you notice the feeling and then you express it in a way that gives the other person a chance to actually take care of you. Just as an example, again, you're on the couch, you're alone. And instead of saying something like, how come you're always on your phone? Or how come we never hang out anymore or something like that? Just being angry, accusatory, which is a very typical response that people have because we are safer with our anger and accusations than we are with our vulnerability. And then it always says, works, right? <laughs> yeah. Yelling off yeah, the right. other person. Well, so the other part of it is from the other side, doing your best to interpret your spouse's uh, statements. So if your spouse does say to you, how come you're always on your phone? 99.9% .9 of the time, what they're expressing is the fact that they're sad and hurt or afraid of the distance that you're seeing. And so instead of going like, I'm not always on my phone, maybe saying something like, oh, are you feeling neglected? Are you feeling distance right now? So that's key. And then once we can communicate that, it compels because we care people to take care of each other and to say, oh, okay, I, you know, you're right. I feel distant too. I don't feel accused by you because you're, you know, you're asking in a nice way. 
let's create some warmth and closeness because we need that. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. So how do you bridge that gap also from two people that have different needs? Different needs? What do you mean? So one person might have a bigger need to be physically close and touch more. And the other person is actually feeling quite well with not touching each other as much. Yeah, well, so it's just a matter of knowing that about yourself, being able to communicate that to your spouse and accommodation. No two people are the same in every aspect for sure. And so it's a matter of owning your feelings and being vulnerable enough to and also confident and secure enough to be able to admit them to someone to say, I need more touch than I think you prefer. Mm. And that's not your fault. It's not my fault. I feel like I need twice as much physical affection that I think you're used to or that you care to do. I'm not going to force you to do m my preference, but I just want you to know. And then that gives the other person a chance to, in some way, okay, let's do, you know, let's meet in the middle somewhere. Um, and taking care of each other during that process. But that's not usually what we do. What we usually, and what we've been modeled by our parents often, is, a, is either shut down and just become avoidant of the whole thing and resent everything, just get more and more anxious and depressed, or to accuse, you're such a cold person, that kind of thing. And that definitely doesn't help people to want to spend time with you, right? No, for sure. So what does it mean, these different attachment styles? So research has found that there are four different attachment styles going back to when we're about a year old, 18 months old, that we can see in the lab uh, among infants and among adults. We have securely attached, which is the most optimal, the most healthy. In a nutshell, securely attached people are people that were raised in a way early in life in which they were able to feel that they were lovable and that other people can be trusted. That when the infant, the 18 year old or the 18 month old, the 24 month old child is sad or hungry or upset or whatever, that they express their discomfort or whatever, or even joy, you know, any kind of emotion. And they are noticed, they are attuned to, meaning that their caregivers notice the emotion and respond in a non anxious, non aggressive, non-complicated way, in a good way, you know? Oh, you're you're happy, I'm happy too. Oh, you're sad that you have to go to bed. I understand, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And through that attunement, emotional attunement, you feel securely attached, and you, meaning that when you're afraid, you run to your secure base, knowing or trusting that 99% of the time, that caregiver is gonna notice you and care for you. Now, of course, we know that not every parent is like this for various reasons, uh, usually because of the way they were raised, honestly. And so in those situations, children have uh, three different choices essentially on how to deal with unattuned parenting, bad parenting, abusive mm -hmm. parenting, neglectful, abandoning, whatever. And sometimes it can just be circumstantial, like the parent dies of cancer or the parent has major depressive disorder and it's not anyone's fault. It just is circumstantial or war, you know, slavery. These kinds of things can obviously be imposed from the outside. Uh, poverty, disease. So uh, children have three different available coping styles that we found through observation over several decades. One is to avoid one, you know, that we'll, we'll see 18 month old children that will have already developed this, what we call avoidant attachment or dismissive attachment, where because of the inconsistent or unattuned parenting, they have decided to turn off and turn away from their caregivers. They uh, subconsciously have decided it's not worth it. And so there's a whole set of emotional uh, pat you know, patterns that those sorts of people follow. And they tend to be very independent and sometimes they can be narcissistic. They're, they can be very into themselves because they've sort of walled themselves off from other people. The other uh, coping style available to young children is what we call preoccupied or anxious. And for these people, they lean in. So they, at, at two years old and at 35 years old, they make their attachment react, reactions very noticeable. These people we might call needy or dependent or dramatic or 
overly emotional because they they knew, they learned when they were young that in order to get anyone to pay attention to them, they had to alert every single emotion that was happening for them all the time. And of course, it's subconscious. It's not a conscious choice. The third choice is kind of the worst choice, which is uh, usually it happens to kids that are traumatized, terrified consistently by a, a scary situation, often physically abusive parents. And for those kids, we call them disorganized or fearful. And for them, they don't really have a way of coping. So they, at, at two years of age, when they want to run to their parents, you'll see them have an urge like, oh, I feel scared and alone. I want to run to my secure base. But wait, my secure base is the source of my trauma and fear. What I, so I need to run away from my secure base. But I need them because I'm afraid right now. But if I run to them, I might get hurt. Ah, you know, so it's a disorganized kind of freak out uh, reaction because they don't have a, a way of actually figuring out what to do in that moment. And that translates into adulthood in a variety of ways. But that's it in a nutshell. Those are the four different attachment styles. Interesting. I would love to dig more into them and like what we can actually do, but just one question before. So as a parent, so like where is that limit from constantly, like when your kids are crying, constantly being there and also teaching them that they have to sleep? Like do you constantly have to be there or is there also a way where you put your kids to sleep and you don't constantly get there when they're crying? Yeah, it depends. Parenting is weird and every kid is weird and every parent is is weird. So we have to uh, not draw any firm rules about parenting. But the the guideline is the de- uh, developmentally appropriate attachment-based parenting. So a six-month-old who is crying all the time, and when you put the six-month-old to bed, just for whatever reason can't really cope with being separated from the parent, then we might want to have the parent uh, sacrifice for a few months and sleep with the six month old as much as possible. Hmm. If the child is four and a half years old and crying every night and can't sleep by themselves, then that's a different strategy. Now we don't want to just throw the child into the deep end of the pool and say, deal with it kid. But there's a different strategy to, to that. And so uh, often in Western societies I have found and research has found that parents generally speed things along too fast and try to adjust their parenting to make the kid more independent too early. And this results in lack of attunement and, and a lot of unnecessary suffering for the child. Um, You know, when I was a kid in the seventies, you just put a kid in a crib at six months or maybe even earlier and you just waited for them to cry it out. You just waited for them to stop crying. But you know the reason why the kids stopped crying was because they gave up on human beings, which is not a conclusion that you want a six-month-old to have. So it's hard to say. Uh, but it, like another scenario that a lot of parents run into is, you know, the kid doesn't want to go down to bed, and so they're crying, and so you're with them emotionally, but mm-hmm. you still have to draw the boundary. So you're, you're very much with them emotionally and you're, I, I get that you're upset. I'm, I know you're sad that you have to go to bed. I know that you're angry that I'm doing this to you. I'm with you. I see you. I notice you and I care. At the same time, if you don't go to sleep right now, it, you know, pe- people need sleep, especially young people in order to survive, in order to be healthy. And I want you to be healthy. And I love you so much that I'm willing to put up with your anger <laughs> to make you go to mm-hmm. sleep. It's complicated, of course, and you know uh, it's heartbreaking to disappoint your children, and some kids react differently than others. But that's what I'll say to that. I don't know if that's a very good answer, though. Fair enough. But that was definitely the question that came up first for me. But so let's say that we so we know we have these four different attachment styles. So what can we do about it? I'm guessing it's not like we're stuck the rest of our life. This is nothing we can do. That would be kind of a dark thought. So what do you recommend that people do? Hire people like me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and <laughs> keep our uh, businesses going. Um, two things. One is to become aware. And when we're aware, we have power. Through our self-awareness, we can change our patterns and say, 
oh, okay, my normal reaction here is to avoid. And I feel that urge. But that's just a defense, which doesn't actually ultimately help me. So I need to try to be vulnerable. So awareness is a big thing. That takes a long time, by the way. Um, I have been studying attachment theory for 25 years, and I'm still learning a lot about myself and how that plays out. The second thing is healing or what we call earned secure attachment through secure attachments in our present life and moving forward, we, we move from the insecure attachment styles to the secure attachment styles. So if you are preoccupied and you have a lot of secure attachments, meaning people who are attuned to you, people who are consistent, they don't hurt you and they're safe and you actually interpret it that way in your mind, then you, through secure attachment, you begin to trust others, you begin to trust yourself, and you don't have those defense mechanisms that get in your way. Mm. So I would assume, and that's just a generalization, that many of the listeners here are people that work a lot of hours. And please correct me. I'm guessing that people that work a lot of hours might be, if they're not in the secure, they might be on the more independent um, and that might be totally wrong. But let's say people that are more independent and working a lot have the the first category you said, which was not an optimal one. So where you kind of depend more on yourself and not attach yourself as much to others. What's one of the first things to do if you figure out that that's your attachment style? The first thing to do is to try to get in touch with your emotions, because one of the things that avoidant people will develop neurologically at early age is a disconnect from one's emotions, a disconnect from your needs, a disconnect from your physiology in terms of how it reacts to certain situations. Um, avoidant people tend to be the last person to know that they're stressed out. People will notice that the person is stressed out and the avoidant person will be like, I'm fine. Everything's fine. I don't need anyone. I don't really have emotions. Everyone else has emotions. I don't really have emotions, but they do. They just don't notice them because subconsciously they cut themselves off from that a long time ago. And so, or they reframe their emotions as like, well, you know, uh, I'm just stressed out or whatever. So the first thing is, is just to become aware of your emotions because once you become aware of that, which is hard to do, by the way, I've worked with clients for years and, you know, we would get like 25% there after five years of therapy. So it's not, it's easier said than done. But once you become aware of your emotions, then you become aware of your needs and then you become aware of how to meet your needs and you become aware of how to get others socially to meet your dependency needs. But it all begins with noticing your emotional state, which is hard to do for some people. Hmm. So what would be one way? Would that be meditating, mindfulness, where you kind of stop up and start to feel how you're feeling or... What would you recommend? Sure. Uh, but on, honestly, uh, it, mindfulness is great and meditation is great, obviously. But I see a lot of avoidant people actually gravitating towards mindfulness because it fits within their defensive structure of avoidance and independence. This notion that I'm upset, so if I'm, I need to figure out a way to cope with this that is, that is solo, that is independent of other people but that's not usually the best way to go the an answer is usually with other people so a way to sort of hit a lot of bases is to go to people and just be like can i just talk with you about what i'm going through right now and maybe i'll get in touch with my emotions and or can you tell me what emotion you think I'm going through? <laughs> what emotion would you be going through if I was, if I, you know, it's that dependency, vulnerability, social piece that a lot of avoidant people are missing. So everyone's different, but, but in therapy, that's what people do. They come to me, avoidant people, and mm -hmm. we'll figure that out. And then instead of them going off into a corner and trying to figure out things on their own, which is, their way, which they had to learn how to do at the age of two years old, I encourage them to talk with me, you know, verbalize, be vulnerable, and then let me in, let, let me into your world. And through that, not only do you become more aware because people are giving you feedback, and that's a really great way to know how you're feeling, is, especially for avoidant people, is 
for other people to be like, well, I don't know. It kind of seems like you're upset. Kind of seems like you're angry. Oh, am I angry? And it kind of gives you a chance to, to think that. But also it gets another uh, base covered, which is that dependency and vulnerability and earned security. Because as you open up to someone and they actually respond to you, that part of your body is like, oh, the lesson I learned at the age of two to cut myself from other, from other people is, is no longer relevant. There's a, there's a person right here in front of me that actually cares, that's safe, that's consistent. And I can start to open up that physiology to these other people. Interesting. How do we do the research to kind of put these categories on? Like, how have we figured out that, okay, this kid, like, because imagine we haven't had cameras to follow this along, right? So did we ask parents how they were raising the kids? And then from that, draw conclusions afterwards? Or how do we come to these conclusions that we, we feel quite certain about? Yeah, excellent question. Love the question. <laughs> Good question. So Mary Ainsworth and others in the 60s or 70s, they did a lab experiment they called the strange situation. And it's sort of complicated, but in a nutshell, what they would do is, and it was always mothers because back in the day, that was the primary parent. Today, we'd probably do it differently, but they would bring in mothers and infants, 18 months, 24 months old, and they would bring the mother and the child into a lab room with toys. It was like a playroom. And they would have cameras through a one-way mirror and they'd be recording everything. This The experiment took like, I don't know, 30 minutes, 60 minutes. The mom would walk in with the kid and for securely attached kids, well, what I'll say is that they observed a lot of different uh, families, or a lot of different mother-child pairs through the following experiment. They would bring the kid into the room, then a stranger would come into the room. So a, a woman who was part of the experiment and, she, and the woman would sit down in the room. So now there's three people in the room and then you'd observe the child's behavior. Then the mother would leave the room and then it was just the stranger and the child and we'd observe the child's behavior. Then the mother would return. And so all three people are back and now we observe the child's behavior. And there's an, uh, other iterations, but so this is called a strange experiment. Strange, mm. I can't remember the exact term, but <laughs> strange, strange situation, sorry. And... So for securely attached kids, what would happen is the infant, the toddler, when they first walked into the room, so it's just mom and child, the child would be very close to the mother because it's a strange, it's a strange room. They're like, okay, where am I? I don't know where I am. But slowly over time, a few minutes passed and the kid is like, okay, I feel secure. My mom seems to feel like this is a secure place for me to explore. I'm going to start crawling across the room. I'm going to, because there's toys but I'm going to look back at my mom. Is everything okay? Okay, I'm going to move a little bit further away. Okay, I'm now playing with toys and I'm enjoying myself and I'm occasionally looking back at my mom. Is everything okay? Then a stranger walks into the room. Holy crap, a stranger. And this is a secure person, right? So the kid runs back to the mom and says, who is this stranger? That's weird. You know, what's going on here? But over time, the child looks back at mom, adventures off, might even go to the stranger a little bit, but wants to go back to the toys. Then the mom leaves the room and the secure child looks around, holy crap, mom's left. And they're anxious, they're upset. And they look to the stranger and they're like, "What are you? why am I stuck in the room with you? And the kid is upset, but not super upset. Upset, but not super upset. The mom returns, the child runs to the mom, is glad the mom returned and says, oh, I'm glad you're back, is grateful and smiles, wipes the tears from their eyes, and again, starts to play with toys. Okay, so that's a securely attached. If you've ever had a two-year-old, you've, you've seen this happen over and over and over again with, with your two and three-year-olds. Okay. Hmm. For avoidant kids, so they found another category of kid, which they later of, of labeled dismissive or avoidant. And that kid, you walk into the room, and in general, the child just didn't really care about a strange, they didn't really distinguish between strangers and between uh, their parents, their mom. So they would instantly go play with the toys. They wouldn't really look back at the mom for security because they learned already that they can't really depend on their mom. And the stranger didn't really stress them out because they're used to not 
really caring about what adults are doing. And so they just seemed kind of like a lump on a log. And when the mom returned to the room, they didn't really run to the mom because it's like, well, you're not my secure base. You're just, you're just another human who feeds me or something. And that's it in a nutshell. For the preoccupied children, uh, so they found another category of kids, preoccupied, uh, anxious kids. The child would not really venture away from the mom very much. The child would stay very close to the mom. When the stranger came into the room, the child would be very upset. When the mother left, the child would scream and scream and scream the entire time and would never kind of relax. And when the mother came back into the room, the child would, would stay uh, upset for a long time, even though the mom was back in the room and would all, sometimes even hit the mom of like, how dare you leave the room? Do not leave me again, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then there was a fourth category of kid who seemed to have no way of reacting, no way of coping. And they, they, when the mom returned, they had urge it. You could tell they had urges to run to the mom, but then they would not really know what to do. And they would sort of freeze. They, they had a lot of fight or flight responses and it's hard to describe disorganized, but that was the fourth category. And so they did this hundreds of times and have since, and it's very consistent. These four categories, secure, avoidant, preoccupied, and disorganized. And what they found was about somewhere about half, uh, 60% of people are secure and about 15% are avoidant, 15% are preoccupied, and about 5% are disorganized. So most people, most parents are raising their kids well, um, but a good number are uh, creating kids with insecure attachment. The other thing I'll say is, listeners out there, if you're trying to diagnose yourself, understand that usually people don't fit neatly into any of these categories. Like for me, for example, I have... Uh, whenever I do these kinds of tests and when I think about it, I'm, I'm mostly secure, but I'm also kind of avoidant. And I also have like a dash of preoccupation. So I have three of these styles inside of me. Now, some people fit very neatly in one, but usually people have combination. So I, does that answer your question? Your very good question, Matt? The thing is super fascinating. So I don't have kids myself, but I, I can imagine that someone would be thinking uh, what you call the avoidance, that, okay, I have a really wonderful kid that already dares to venture out themselves. So that would be my logical conclusion, that my kid is very adventurous, wants to go out in the world, and not that I had brought the kid up to be more of an avoidance uh, kid. So I, I could imagine listeners as well being like, hmm, how is that? So like we did this lab test several times. Did we then follow up with these kids 30 years after to look into the relationships, or how did we make these conclusions? So I just, I had a discussion with a medical doctor the other day. That's also why I'm bringing it up, where we discussed kind of the validity of different science and how we can really draw conclusions. Yeah, well, it gets fuzzy because when we're talking about personality and development, humans are squishy things that have a lot of different factors and mm. we can think quite sophisticatedly, if you will. And so things can not, th 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 things don't lend themselves to categorization in psychology as well as they do in things like medicine or geology or astronomy. You know, there's a distinct difference between a, you know, gas giant planet and a rocky planet like ours. And yeah. you just, you know, you just categorize these things. But in psychology, we have these, you know, we have these things called attachment styles. How do we distinguish? Hmm. With, with infants, it, it's pretty easy because they tend to react in these very fundamental ways. And so in the lab, it's pretty easy to actually say, okay. And, and a lot of people observing would be like, yeah, that, that looks like a sound way of codifying that behavior and, and categorizing these things. When it comes to adults, it gets a lot harder because we have defenses upon defenses upon defenses. You know, two-year-olds have very fundamental primary or primitive defense styles that you can observe very quickly. If you've ever been around a three-year-old for a while, you, you see these very obvious ways of coping with difficulty. Adults have very elaborate ways of dealing with mm. difficulty. And so we, w now I do, I am convinced by the model and I am convinced by the 
primary researchers in attachment theory for adults. I have used it myself, but I would never claim that I could point to a physical marker the way that someone in geology can. And so therefore I have to say, well, you know, if, if this isn't compelling to you, if this model doesn't make sense to you, hmm. after, you know, learning the whole theory and, and understanding all the research, if, if this isn't compelling to you, then, <clears throat> you know, I, I get it because it is such a squishy thing. But I use this with my clients and that's, to me, psychological models are only as good as they are useful. So is attachment theory useful? Absolutely. And <clears throat> countless therapists and clients and listeners to my podcast have found it to be extremely useful. It's very a a applicable. So hmm. um, is it accurate or not? Uh, uh, it's in the eye of the, of, the, of the beholder. Fair. So let's say that we buy these attachment styles are something that we can work with, which I think is the most important part is basically whether a model is 100% true or not. Does it help us somehow? Does it make us feel better? Does it make that we can actually work on something? I think that's the one of the key things as well with a model. So let's say you don't have the avoidance, but you had the third category or the second category of clinging very much to people. What what would you do there? Like what's something concrete that if someone is like listening to this and be like, okay, I can definitely recognize what Kirk is saying. Uh, that's one of the challenges that I run into in relationships that I often hear. What could a person, apart from going to a psychologist, of course, and talk about it, what, what could a person like that do? Again, it's, it's earned security mm. th through understanding what your emotions are. So, and this really can apply to anybody, but if we're spe you know, specifically talking to preoccupied people. So these people, when I talk about attachment theory, instantly recognize what's going on. Uh, I teach this to my students as well, and I have them analyze themselves as a way of getting to know the theory. And it's almost universal that preoccupied people, when I describe attachment theory, they instantly say, oh my God, that's me. You know, a, a, key, a key behavior in our modern times is if you frequently find yourself getting angry at people for not texting you back very quickly, mm -hmm. yeah. so that's a preoccupied uh, sign. Yeah. Because it's like you text someone and you're like, it's been... 24 hours and they haven't texted me back. Okay, to the secure person, they're like, well, I'm sure they're busy. I trust other human beings. Or you know what, if they don't like me, I'm okay. I'm okay mm -hmm. as a person. To the avoidant person, it's like, they don't even text to begin with because they don't reach out. <laughs> so these people tend, they tend to like, what, text? I don't even know. Uh, to the disorganized person, that's a whole other category. It's complicated, I won't get into. But the preoccupied person, they are frequently reaching out and frequently feeling like people aren't getting back to them fast enough or well enough. And so preoccupied people instantly, oh my God, that's me, that's me, that's me. Avoidant people will say, no, I think I'm securely attached. And then by week five of the, of the term, they're like, no, I think I'm avoidant. <laughs> because it, again, it takes a while for them to get in touch with their feelings. Hmm. So the preoccupied person, it's a matter of getting to know and really embracing your dependency because the good thing about preoccupied people as opposed to avoidant people is preoccupied people actually recognize their emotions and they they feel their emotions and they recognize their dependency. It's kind of a superpower where they're like, wow, when I need something, I really notice it. <laughs> I instantly have a feeling of panic and and hurt. That's a good thing. It's you, It's a you're miles ahead of the avoidant person in terms of noticing your emotions. Now, what do you do with them? That's the thing, because the amount of hurt you feel is probably exaggerated. And so when you feel hurt that someone isn't texting you back, then you get angry and then you get accusatory. And then you start having narratives that people can't be depended on or that person is, is neglectful and gaslighting you or whatever kind of term people say these days. That's another thing. A lot of preoccupied people today use the term gaslighting in my belief, d defensively. And I never so, heard that word before. I heard ghosting, but that's more, uh, ghosting is more in, uh, in dating, apparently when you suddenly stop answering someone. I'm not sure, gaslighting, I haven't heard that. Yeah, well, okay, so going with ghosting, uh, preoccupied people, I'm guessing, are more likely to feel ghosted and avoidant people are more likely to ghost, right? Um, I yeah. don't know that for sure. I'd have to see the, the uh, research on that, but 
But so when you notice the feeling, what do you do with it? So instead of getting angry and accusatory or distancing yourself, having a owning the feeling and being okay with it. It's like, you know what? That person didn't text me back yesterday. That kind of hurt my feelings. And what do you do with it? You know, how do you communicate that to the other person? That doesn't make the other person feel hurt. So you say, you know what? You didn't text me back yesterday. Totally fine. But I just want to let you know, I'm really sensitive to that kind of stuff. And it really hurt my feelings. Yeah, I, I understand if you don't, you, I'm not telling you you did anything wrong, but I'm just telling you I'm a very sensitive person. And when you didn't text me back, it just hurt my feelings. I just want you to know that because I really care about our relationship. And I, I don't know, I'm just trying to be more healthy in terms of how I communicate. So that's a very non-accusatory way of bringing it up, you're, but you're bringing it up. And that gives the other person a chance to <clears throat> understand your vulnerabilities and take care of you. And, you, and then through experience, you have the earned security because people do care. And when they're given a chance, they will rise to the occasion. That makes sense. I've definitely found in, in my personal relationships, so I've, I try to study more books on relationships as well and understand like what are, what are the needs that are different than my own needs. So if I'm working, I, I love to work, but that also means I get really occupied. Everything around me disappears because I get like, yeah, I find it so fascinating. S same thing with learning new things, but uh, remembering to then spend more time on entering during the day or make sure to give a call later during the day or like in the evening and then catch up. That can be a way of, of showing that caring still, despite not needing, despite not having the same need for speaking throughout the entire day. But Kirk, I'm, I'm quite curious as well on your perspective on that, because back in the days, before everyone had a cell phone, you saw your loved ones in the morning and when you got home. But today you have the possibility to constantly ride back and forward. So is it perfectly fine still to just communicate before you leave and then get him back? Or what's, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's a good question. It depends, obviously, on the individual's. People tend to have a knowing styles of reaching out to others when they have a baseline of feeling insecure. So if someone feels secure, if two people are attending to each other's attachment needs and two people are owning their attachment reactivity and are aware of it and are able to bid ongoing for that. So mm -hmm. say you have like a month of, of a couple where 95% of the time they own their feelings, they communicate, they get their attachment needs met, and they have that security. Well, on the 31st day, when say one person is at home and uh, wants to reach out to their spouse who's at work, and they text that person, and that person doesn't get back, all that 30 days of security affects that reactivity of just like, well, I've had 30 days of feeling very secure with that person, so even though I kind of want them to get back to me, the fact that they're not getting back to me um, will uh, make me so that I can get through this moment because I've, I have a working model of this person that says that they do care about me even though I don't have any direct evidence of it. You don't think but that if the opposite where someone is like, oh, I wonder what's wrong, like the last 30 days I had an answer straight away and now I'm not getting it? No, and that that's the the trick that I think a lot of us play on ourselves or society plays on us. It's a similar trick that we play on with children of like, okay, my 12-month-old child is, is really dependent on me. So I need to teach this one-year-old child that they need to grow up because they can't always depend on other people and me. And so I have to pull away from this child and let them figure things out on their own. By doing that, you actually make the child more dependent. So given the developmental stage, so with one years of age, it's almost universal this to be true of when the child is reaching out for you in a dependent way, if you meet that dependency, then later on, they don't depend on you anymore because they, they have a working model of self and others that, that is secure where they, they don't have to run back to you always because of terror that you're going to run away. And when they know they can go to you, so to, 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 to the adult of, if you have secure attachment between two people, a style of security between two people overall, and you build that up over time, and then when you don't text back right away, the person who texted from home has all that security to, to fall back on of like, well, the only reason why they're not texting, the, the reason why they're not texting back is not because they're going to abandon me. 
it's because they're busy or they just don't want to, which is fine. But you have to have that security in order to be able to have that perspective. Because if for preoccupied people in particular, since day one, they have been constantly feeling as though people are just out of reach. And so they feel like they're, they have to constantly reach out to other people. But once you actually meet that need, which I've done with clients, then they relax for the first time in their life. They're like, okay, you know what? This person is there for me. And now I don't have to worry now because they've proven to me that through a lot of tests that they are secure. And when they don't get back to me, I, I don't have to worry because they've been so consistently there for me. But that takes a lot of time. So, um, you know, it's complicated, but I don't know. Are you suffering from someone texting you at work, Matt? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, not too bad. So, but I think I had in several relationships where we had to discuss the like, how much can I reach back at work? It was easier when I was studying. But when I was working, for example, as a management consultant, like, it's like I didn't really have the time to uh, to text during the day. That was very much like you're always uh, behind on hours. So that was more. I always called in the evening and gave full attention there, like on my way home. And I found that that has helped a lot in my situations. So, um, and I know other people are, are struggling as well sometimes with uh, texting too many times at work. And, and I also just find it interesting, like that balance of back in the days, we didn't have that opportunity. So then it wasn't expected. But now that it is actually possible and so easy, the expectation changes. And because the expectation changes, it also means something different in our relationship. Do I feel cared for? Do I feel like I'm getting proper attention? I have another good friend who is, um, I don't know his attachment style. He seems like one of the most uh, loving people that I know. And, and really cares for his girlfriend, but he's very strict on like when he's working, he, she can call him if there's something important, but he's not going to text back straight away if there's nothing really important. Yeah. So here we get into the messiness of real life. We mm. can theorize about categories and make general statements about attachment. But when we actually interface with real life, that's when we have to explore things, you know? So for you know, you and your relationship or your friend and, and their relationship, we'd have to really talk with them about where they're coming from, what their emotions that they're feeling. Because like with your friend, is there's a possibility that his spouse doesn't feel very secure either because of her history hmm. or because of the way that he reacts to her. There's a possibility that he thinks that he's being very loving and, and you experience him as being very loving and caring, but she doesn't for whatever reason. Yeah. And maybe that usually when, when there's conflict around these kinds of details, like you're not getting back to me or I need you to get back to me at work. Usually it's a symptom of a larger problem that mm. once I investigate, I can usually detect and address more directly. You know, people end up fighting about the little things when in, usually there's a much bigger problem that generates these little problems, if that makes sense. So it, it really come down to an investigation in, on that level. For sure. I think in my friend's case, they don't really have a problem with him not answering back. That was at least what he said. Like I kind of made that clear quite fast that um, I'm there, fully there when we are together. I'm not on my phone and so on. But, but when I'm working on that, I'm not like answering constantly. That's not that I don't love her or anything else. And she's seems as far as i can sense in the relationship they've been together for many years and actually kind of the couples that you look and like that seems pretty cool at least from the outside and he seems to be fairly honest about if they have challenges or not and it seemed like they're meeting their attachment needs at least so in that way but so that was also the curiosity like like what do you set up as the baseline is it okay and then say like i i love you and i'm definitely there when we are together but also when i'm working i'm working but if something is really needed during work, I, I will pick up my phone. Yeah. Yeah. So culture plays in, into the situation. Like maybe she comes from a family where her, her parents checked in a lot, mm. regardless of being at work. And so it's just a cultural expectation that mm. when she is with him, she it, it looks weird to her and she it misinterprets it as neglect or or being unfair in some way. So yeah. sometimes it's a matter of that or, you know, it's, it could be any number of things. But the key is, is that it sounds like they are 
how do you navigate that between two people so that each person feels loved and cared about and heard and understood? It's mm-hmm. not a matter of doing whatever your spouse tells you to do. Uh, no. it's, it's a matter of how the two of you take care of each other through inherent conflicts that, that are just going to happen. And how, do you, how does each person walk away going, you know what, I'm pretty sure that my spouse loves me and cares about my feelings and wants to do the right thing. But I also mm-hmm. understand that there are other factors at play and so that I can't always get my needs met. And that's okay for the most part. You know, it's, it's never like my partner loves me 100 billion percent and I am 100 billion percent awesome person and our relationship is the best. It's never that. It's always like, okay, my spouse mostly loves me the way I want them to. And I probably mostly love my spouse the way that they want me to. <laughs> um, our relationship is mostly okay. I'm mostly a good person. People are mostly good. Uh, yeah. It's never 100%. Got it. So Kirk, time is running. And I think we could continue this talk for hours. I think it's super fascinating. Both like what you can actually do and and how you understand yourself and how you attach yourself to others. Where can people find out more about you? Because I know you've been discussing these subjects a lot longer if people are more curious to learn more. Yeah. Well, I think I said at the beginning, uh, for 12 years, I've been doing a podcast called Psychology in Seattle that is available on podcast platforms. and And also, we're getting our YouTube channel going, Psychology in Seattle, that has all the regular audio only episodes. Hmm. And, but we're also starting to publish a lot of videos too. Like I said, reaction videos. I, I did a video recently of me reacting to uh, therapy examples in movies like Goodwill Hunting. Yeah. And uh, that's been kind that's of fun. That's a good fun. movie. Yeah, I it's love it. One that of my movie. favorite movies, to be honest. Yeah. The scene where he's like, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. I mean, it makes me cry every time. It's just an amazing example of... Now, there's also some bad therapy in that movie. That's pretty obvious. But um, but it's one of the few examples where, as a therapist, I can actually point to it and say, like, that's what therapy looks like. Not everything else on, the, on TV and movies. It, you know, it's usually really... Anyway, so that's where they can find me. Sounds good. So any parting advice for the listeners out there? One, two, three things to, uh, to highlight. Well, listen to Mads because he seems like a very wise and good interviewer. Seems like a very curious, exploratory person, jovial and nice. Uh, we got into some serious topic, but uh, before we recorded, he, you know, he seems like a delightful, jovial, intelligent dude. Thank you, Kurt. I, I think that's one of the top advice I got in the podcast. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Kurt, thank you so much for spending the time and enlightening us and really going into also like how do we how do we learn about this stuff with enlightenment or with attachment styles and, and what we can do. I really appreciate that. No problem.